All right, all you cool cats and kittens. Uh, we are back with another pre-ownership underwater episode. I am here with our very own Matt Garino once again. And uh, for this episode, we're going to be looking at a much larger, I believe it's actually the largest practice that we looked at, uh, group practice is being evaluated. A lot of moving parts here. Uh, I think it's going to have a lot of value for you guys. How do you feel about it, Matt? I mean, this is a spectacular practice. And thanks, Tyler, for having me on. Uh, I kind of feel like I'm an MLB player who struggles a little bit against lefties and the coach always takes him out against lefties. But in reality, I'm not that bad. <laughs> it's kind of like me with these group practices, you know, yeah. George has cornered the market on the group practice guy, but actually I'm pretty good at evaluating these, but it you know, could toot my own horn for a second there. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, I hope that you're going to gain some legitimacy with this one. I think people will be impressed uh, with your acumen. Uh, one thing that's really interesting about uh, working with Matt as opposed to George is, you know, George is, uh, he likes to wing things. He's kind of a, a rain man of sorts. He kind of comes in, just digests information all at once, and then spits it back at you. Uh, Matt is much more methodical and meticulous in his process, and I have been very impressed with his ability uh, to sort of take this thing through step by step. And I think that a lot of people are probably going to um, have like that a little bit more because it'll kind of help them walk through it as well. So Yeah, sure. I mean, we all have our own styles. It works for George. This is what I have to do, unfortunately. Um, and then, uh, just a general point on, on these practices. So, you know, evaluating group and solo offices is pretty similar. You're using the same kind of principles. You're just kind of looking, uh, deeper in different areas. And as you guys listen to more and more of these, you'll notice which ones we focus on for the different areas. Um, so I just want everyone to know that, you know, it's, it's the same principles that we use to evaluate these things. And, um, you know, I hope you enjoyed this one. All right. We're going to be hosting a webinar on the Share Practices group page at 7 p.m. Eastern on June 17th for Matt's group coaching program and also for my own group coaching that will be offered to dental students. And you want to learn more about it. Really hope to see you guys there 7 p.m. Eastern on June 17th, the Share Practices group page. I'm super excited. And I want to hear from you all. All right, and we are back, and we are here with Iron Man. Uh, we're going to be looking over a really interesting, uh, huge group practice uh, for Iron Man here. But before we get into it, um, I want him to uh, give us a little bit of background about where he's coming from and uh, you know what he's working with. So without further ado, Iron Man, hello. Welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. I uh, wanted to say thanks, first of all. Um, don't want to take too much time, but... Your show kind of really changed the trajectory of what I thought was possible. I uh, never thought of uh, being a dentist my whole life growing up, actually. This is kind of a second career for me. I oh, really? uh, did my undergrad in accounting, and then I was a financial analyst for a little while. And oh. uh, now here I am as a dentist. <laughs> so this so is right. it's no big deal for you. This is another day. Well, I love it, actually. Yeah, it's a, numbers are fun. Excel is my oh, favorite no. program. In the world. Well, that's 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 very <laughs> inconvenient for us because we kind of built we've built this business off of you know sort of uh, counting on the fact that the people we're helping just don't really know anything about those things. So I feel like we might actually get humbled here. That's, that's uh, I don't know about that. I like numbers, but I uh, the second part of it is not ever having planned on being a dentist, or I have nobody in my family that's in right. healthcare at all. So this is okay. all a new uh, a new world for me, I guess. But yeah. Uh, so, so- I am a little bit curious about what what was the catalyst that, that brought you into dentistry? Uh, long story. Um, never thought about it once. Did accounting. I was going to do an MBA. Uh, okay. My wife uh, is an attorney. She was in law school at the time when I decided that I was going to make the big the big leap from uh, okay. finance to dentistry. But uh, it's just been a really good decision. You know, we thought about okay. it for a long time, and and uh, it's been good so far. Okay, so what what's your journey since dental school been like? Kind of walk me through the steps. Um, so I graduated two thousand seventeen from okay. Oregon Health and Science University, Portland, Oregon. Um, I did the HPSP scholarship. Yes. So um, I am currently serving as active duty in the Navy, I'm stationed in Hawaii, okay. and uh, I have one year left um, until my contract is up. And uh, currently, I'm in a 
really good spot actually as far as uh military or active duty dentistry goes i think i okay run a, a branch clinic so i'm the only dentist there it's, it's separate from the main clinic we've got four operatories i have four staff members and i kind of am able to, as much as possible uh, to do my own thing in the military so that's where we're at yeah so uh, tell me a little bit more about you know the dynamic that you're kind of experiencing working in the military um, and, and I'm kind of curious how it relates to, you know, your desire looking for this big Mondo practice you brought up to us. Um, the military was always, uh, from when we first, you know, pursued this option, it was kind of going to be kind of a way to pay for school and to okay. get some experience. I was going to kind of count it as, you know, an AGD, a four year AGD, sure. um, my first uh, area I was at was uh, with the Marines at their boot camp in South Carolina and just tons of reps of doing, you know, everything, third molar extractions all day for like six weeks straight. And then it did oh, you know, end of rotation. It was basically like an AGD. Oh, um, wow. So that was really good. And uh, can't say anything bad about Hawaii. So I've, I've been pretty lucky with my duty stations and my experience so far. Yeah, I would say so. So it sounds like you've gotten a pretty good sampling of different specialty procedures and stuff like that, and 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 you're enjoying it. I would assume. Yeah, yeah. I don't have anything uh, too bad to say. <laughs> it's been really good. Okay. I'm I'm glad I did it this way. Yeah. So uh, how how have your experiences kind of played into uh, your vision? I mean, I know you mentioned that you've been listening to the Share Practice podcast, and that's been very formative um, in in putting all that together. Um, and I'm curious how that sort of interplayed with with your experiences in the military um yeah so like i said i don't have any backgrounds in healthcare. my family nobody yeah. in my family um so i had very um incorrect uh ideas about what dentistry was like what was possible okay. and i went to dental school like thinking that 150 175 was like you know pretty much max of what you'd make as a dentist mm -hmm. Um, had no idea. Unfortunately, I found podcasts later than some. It was like the end of my D4 year when I actually found out about this podcast and other podcasts in general. Um, mm -hmm. So ever since then, I've been listening and you know, my mind has been opened to what's really possible. Um, so as far as like my goals and visions, I, I don't have a good solid idea of what uh, that is. I, I do know that I want to, I want to do the Justin short thing, uh, work a couple days, three days would be awesome. So that mostly so that my wife, you know, can be uh, fulfilled professionally. Cause right now uh, she's just staying at home with the kids while we're here in Hawaii. But once we get to the mainland and get to practice and get settled, I want to, you know, give her time to, to be fulfilled as well. So, so you're in the, the Navy, you found the podcast and that kind of, uh, awoken you to what's possible. When was it that you decided, um, ownership as soon as you're done with your term there? And, you know, since when have you been started looking and how'd you stumble around, uh, this practice? Um, ownership was always the goal, even before, you know, I went to dental school. Um, like I said, I wanted to do the military four years and, and, uh, call it call it a day after that mm -hmm. um i i've been looking for fun pr since i graduated basically i uh i'm hooked up with all the brokers that kind of service the pacific northwest where i'm most interested in okay. and i uh, just get emails all the time for practices and there's been a big uptick in the last month or so which you know i'm assuming we all know the reason for dentists that just don't want to have to hassle with all the new PPE and stuff like that. Yeah, of course. Um, and yeah, this practice just got emailed to me and it was the first one that I looked at and ran the numbers that like didn't have too many red flags and like looked awesome. Sure. So I thought I would uh, get a second opinion on it. Right, right. So wh what were some of the selection criteria that you had when you were looking at the practices that were being sent to you? And why did this one check your boxes exactly? And and I, we haven't talked to the audience much about what this practice is. So if you want to go ahead and, you know, kind of talk about that as well. Yeah, sure. Um, I have told the brokers that, you know, I want, 
you know, 800,000 collections and up, nothing below that. Um, about five operatories is about the minimum I was looking at. And like I said, Pacific Northwest, um, probably Oregon's my number one state, Washington, number two, Montana, number three. Um, but anywhere in those, those states would be okay. My uh, wife doesn't want it to be too rural and I don't want it to be too metro. So we're trying to meet somewhere in between. Um, as far as this practice, just real quick, um, it's in uh, Puget Sound area. Um, currently has, I say, two and a half doctors. There's the owner and a full-time associate and then a part-time associate. Th uh, four hygiene, three front desk, um, five assistants, 10 ops with one that's unplumbed. So it could be 11. Sure. Uh, um, it's in a massive, like, uh, 4,300 square foot. They said it's a historic building. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly, but really big. So it's kind of, kind of a converted. It it's old. Yeah. It's kind of like a converted. <laughs> I think that's a nice way to say it's old. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> uh, converted house or whatever. Um, they do have a 3D tour of it. So I was able to, like, walk through oh, the cool. building and uh, tons of wasted space, actually. There's like a, Mm -hmm. entryway like a mud room it's like as big as my bedroom um, <laughs> and then there's a there's a first waiting room and then there's a second completely separate second waiting room that i guess they're just trying to find uses for all these rooms that they had in this old house oh my gosh yeah um yeah um as far as numbers go uh i don't have it up on on front of me but it was about you know two 2.5 uh, million okay. in collections last year and it's I wouldn't say I've been looking for this practice the whole time um, just because I don't really know what I'm looking for but uh, it kind of uh, seems like it would fit me really well as a military dentist you know I as a general dentist I am not allowed to place implants you know we don't do a whole lot of veneers or cosmetics no ortho so all the like more like second tier procedures, um, I don't do currently. Um, I plan to in the future, but I feel like more of like a group practice where it's more bread and butter would be a better fit for my clinical suite right now than kind of like a super GP solo owner would be. So you're like a, a year and a couple months away from having your full on private practice license and being able to buy these practices. So how are the brokers handling you given that you are a bit of a longer timeline? Yeah. So I've been emailing them for a couple of years now and uh, they just, they send me the prospectuses and they talk to me a little bit about it. Um, I have, I guess I say I have my banker set up. Um, I think I'm going to go with Columbia bank. Um, okay just kind of, you know, the pre-qualification stuff. I've got a relationship going with the banker there. Great. And, um, you know, nothing is like, I haven't even put an LOI in or thought about it really, but uh, just kind of getting all my ducks lined up so that uh, when it does come time, um, it'll, it'll be pretty smooth, hopefully. For sure. You have all your ducks in a row. So you reached out to, you know, get our advice in this practice. What were you looking to get out of our call tonight? And um, what kind of, you know, areas of pause did you have with this practice? Uh, yeah, so I uh, I have taken the uh, ownership accelerator course. I did that. All right, I'm just, I haven't finished it yet, but I'm almost done. I've been doing it little by little throughout uh, the last couple of years since I graduated. So I have the the spreadsheet that George made, I think for the, you know, the financial analysis of the practice, plugged all the numbers in. And, uh, as you guys probably saw the staff overhead percentage was super high. Um, 56%, I believe, um, what I came up with anyways. And that, that includes the associate doctors. So I have never evaluated a practice like mm -hmm. this where there's multiple associates. So I wasn't sure if that number was valid or, yeah. or not. Because if it was a single doc practice, that would be like, you know, massive red flag. So yeah, sure. I reached out. I reached out and asked mostly about that. Like, is this 
is this okay? Is this normal? Um, okay. Is this something to be like, okay, deal breaker right here, or is it okay? Okay. So it, one thing that I've kind of gathered, you know, as far as what you want to hear from about this practice in particular is, are there any red flags that you're missing? Uh, you know, are these staff costs, you know, way out of proportion, something that makes this a no. Um, but, you know, one thing I do want to kind of tie back to is you mentioned that you're not in, you don't totally have clarity on what it is that your vision is, right? However, you do have your ducks all in a row. It sounds like if you if you got a green light on this practice, there's actually a pretty high likelihood that you would start moving forward with it. Is that correct? Um, yeah, for sure. This is in the spot that that I would love to live. Actually, there's okay. Uh, yeah, good spot. Um, it seems like it's a good practice, and yeah. the owner doc is currently working three days a week already. So it wouldn't be yeah, you know, a huge thing for me to continue that on, which is kind of what I want to do. I understand. So the only thing I'm trying to get at is when you say that you're not entire, entirely clear about your vision, I mean, you say that, you know, you want to live in this area. Um, this practice seems like a good practice to quote you. Um, and if it had a green light, you would go for it. It almost sounds like there, there is some clarity there, but I'm curious what you perceive as, as missing and uh, maybe mm-hmm. what you're not totally sure about yet. Uh, I guess I'm just really open to all the options at the moment. Um, okay. I have trouble closing doors, I guess, on on opportunities. So, have okay. Well, I mean, I'll make this short. Don't close this opportunity, and I would I would run through it, and uh, <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't sit on it. Uh, I mean, we'll That's we'll go fair. into it, and we can pretty much start now about Definitely. you know some problems with it because it's not a it's not a perfect practice. I'm you know you mentioned the staff costs being high as one of them. Um, it has others, um, but like overall, just general sense, this is a great practice. Like it has. All the patient flow. It's got 3,500 patients. It's got four full time hygienists, two and a half doctors. It's got the 10 ops. So you got the capacity, you got the patient flow. Where the downfalls of the practice are, are staff, <clears throat> as you mentioned. But I think a lot of that has to do with health insurance being given, I think, on the prospectus to employees and families. 100%. Which, uh, yeah. Which <laughs> is, uh, that's, yeah. That's unusual. And um, life, life insurance also. So health insurance and life insurance. Right. 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 After like six months of employment, that, that definitely struck yeah. me as well. Yeah. So we'll talk about at the end, kind of what you can do around that, you know, say you buy this practice, um, a small red flag. Um, the other being a, a very, which is a good problem to have with what I'm getting into is a, a lower doctor production. Your the hygiene production anywhere from 45 to 50% of the production is hygiene. So super strong hygiene, super weak restorative. Um, I'd be curious to know, I mean, I don't know if you know, cause you've just got this email. It's like, the clinical strengths of the associates and the owners, like where is the breakdown in why the doctor production is so low? Um, all three of the docs do general stuff. So looking at the production report by ADA code, uh, the owner doc, you know, crowns and bridges, a couple bridges, mostly fillings and crowns, one, one removable case, um, the younger, there's a younger associate doc, um, that's actually, he's, he's moving away. So that's the reason why okay. the owner is selling, but he did, I think okay. one code that I don't do, he did, he did one bone graft and that's the only thing that I, that I don't do currently. Um, so yeah. how will you ever replace that one? I know. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Um, uh, yeah. as far as like, they don't, they don't do any endo, like yeah. total between the three docs. I think they did less than 10 cases, mostly, you know, anteriors and they did like two posteriors, um, you know, probably, I don't know, 50 extractions total between the three of them. So just a lot of, uh, lower end stuff. Right. And, and you mentioned that you already kind of got some reps in with a lot of that stuff in the military as well. You said you had an endo rotation and like, right, it's yeah. terrible or extraction. So you may actually already have a more of a clinical repertoire than, than they do already. I think I would definitely be able to add, um, you know, third molar extractions. I'm pretty yeah. confident in that. Endo, I don't, I don't love molar endo, so I might not expand that too much, but I could definitely do more yeah. of the anterior type stuff. Uh, one thing that... Go ahead, Tyler. Yeah, I was just going to say that one thing that kind of struck me is in a in a practice this large, <clears throat> especially with as, with as many cooks are in the kitchen, it kind of surprised me um, that that was, you know, those things were still being left on the table. You know what I mean? 
Um, I, I would. Do you feel the same way, Matt? That, that it, it's sort of surprising that those, those sort of things are not being provided all under one roof with that many providers. I felt like that was kind of special. Yeah, I can't imagine with a three doctor practice with ten ops that they at least didn't think about getting an associate with more clinical skills or bringing in a, in-house specialists, like something to keep that stuff in house because they have the capacity, they have the space. You know what's preventing them. So I'm curious from you, uh, Mr. Iron Man here, what like what do you feel like your role is going to be clinically? Are you going to be the one that is keeping those specialty procedures in house, or do you see yourself more as like uh, more of a manager type? Like, are you are you a George, or are you more of a you know producer? Hmm. Um, say Matt, say Matt, the third person. I, <laughs> I, uh, I wasn't going to do that. I think my personality. <laughs> is more of like work hard. Um, I like to stay busy. My, you know, my clinic that I have right now, um, it's hard to compare apples to apples, you know, military and private sure. practice, but, but my clinic does pretty good. We, <laughs> we do about 70% more production than the average of the other dentists in my wow. commands. Um, so we're doing a lot of, you know, basic stuff, like I was saying. So I think... I would like to be a producer. Um, I, I can definitely, like I said, bring bring surgery to the table. Um, through my GI Bill, I'm going to take, I uh, forget the name of it. There's, there's an implant course in Vancouver, BC, or in BC that uh, accepts the VA GI Bill benefits. Okay. So I'm planning on taking that pretty much as soon as I you know, get out of, of active Great. duty. Here. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, for yourself, have you identified, I mean, you already kind of mentioned some things that you're trying to expand on clinically, but have you identified any of the rocks with this practice when you're looking at it, you see things deficient and you're like, okay, this, these are the things that I want to tackle as soon as I walk in the door. Are there things that you've already identified? Uh, I haven't looked uh, that deep into it mo- really. Okay. Um, just the staff basically. Um, yeah. And I feel like uh, the personnel that are there, they have a lot of senior, uh, staff there, you know, one of the, a couple of the, the hygienists and assistants and front desk, can't remember who exactly, but, you know, they were hired in like 1993, 1986. Um, so keeping their goodwill sure. while, you know, making changes and making them, you know, maybe more up to speed with co-diagnosis and stuff like that may be a challenge. Yeah. I want to, I want to reflect something and it could be a total assertion here. Um, I kind of feel like you're looking for reasons to, to say no rather than reasons to say yes. Is that accurate? Uh, I'm a pretty pessimistic person. So maybe, yeah, <laughs> maybe, yeah. uh, it's, it's a bigger practice than I ever thought I would be looking at. So maybe I'm a little nervous about that too. Maybe. Sure. Yeah. yeah I, I would take a look to see what actually is going on because that's um, probably not serving you in your practice search. That, that feeling of, you know, I'm, uh, there's got to be something off here and I'm going to find it. I'm going to, you know, ask people to see if they see it um, because it'd be more uh, apt for you to see the things that are great about it and the things that you can improve on that are the weaknesses rather than, is there something wrong with this practice? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, there, there are certainly some low hanging fruit here that I, that I think that yeah. if taken advantage of could probably blow out of the water. Some of those red flags that you've already identified. Yeah. Where, so I'm curious, uh, where do you see the path for this practice? Say you do, you do get into it. Where are you in a year and what kind of, uh, knobs are you turning in that year? Now that I'm a, you know, aspiring DJ. <laughs> Um, well, hope to, uh, increase, you know, clinical production on the doctor side, keep more stuff in house. Um, I do know that the younger of the associates, like I said, is, is moving away, but the owner and the part-time, uh, associate or owner to soon to be associate, uh, they plan on practicing indefinitely is what they said. Um, so no plans for them to uh, retire, I guess, anytime soon. So I guess I would be replacing that one associate that's leaving and hopefully just increasing the amount of things that we can keep in house. Right. Right. Can I, can I add a couple of things? What I see? Sure, please. And I totally agree with everything you just said. Um, I see first path is adding another hygienist. They said in the prospectus, they're booking out seven weeks. You know, right now they're using probably seven at most eight of the 10 ops. So they have the space. 
I would add another four day a week hygienist instantly. Um, I would, you know, get rid of the associate who is, who is moving away. You know, you come in, you're adding more procedures. I would also look, you know, as soon as you can, CBCT added to the pano, your implant course you're going to take. So you can do some, I would do then in-house specialists, IV sedation, third molars, full mouth implants, full mouth extraction dentures. Like I would love a, a, cl- a surgical suite in this office that could just even bump up production even more. Um, and then, you know, we didn't, we didn't get into the marketing piece. So this practice doesn't do any marketing for what I could tell. Right. Correct. Yeah. A little bit of Facebook right. and word of mouth. Yeah. So it's, it, they have, you know, almost no Google reviews. Of course, that's an area to look first. The area around them, the dentists aren't super active on, on the internet. So it, it's going to be an easy market to dominate. Um, I think the most reviews I saw was like a hundred and then the rest were well below that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's already getting 30 new patients a month with no marketing, just word of mouth. So that could easily get up over 50 to 60. You know, it's, there's a lot, there's a lot of growth areas in this practice I see. And that's why, like, ultimately I would, I would put an LOI in like after we talked or, or I might move to the Pacific Northwest and do it. <laughs> you take it. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted to visit and maybe look. Should, should visit. It's a great place. Yeah. 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 That. Yeah. So Iron Man, how, how are you feeling about that? I mean, do you feel like, you know, that, that kind of gives you that green light? Is that what you were waiting to hear and that you're totally ready to go or is that, or, or is there still some, kind of something holding you back there? No. Yeah. I, like, I, I don't know what George told you about our, our little Facebook conversation, but I just kind of wanted a second opinion, someone to, sure. that has more experience and to give me some more confidence in you know going forward on something like this. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know, like, so this is on the market now, like, have you talked to the broker about it at all? Are the sellers looking to sell now? Like where, what is their timeline? Do you think there's a chance it matches with yours? Um, so that's going to be a sticking point, uh, because of COVID-19. Um, my banker said that they are not doing any deals at all. Like they like put a stop to everything Really, when practices start to open up, which, some people have said Washington State's opening. Some people have said they, it's not. So I'm not exactly sure. Okay. But my my banker said one to two months when things are starting to open up, they're going to start to look at doing lending again. Um, I think it's reasonable to, you know, hold off six to eight months to see if this practice recovers because it's a heavy hygiene practice, which is, you know, one of the biggest controversies in dentistry now is is it safe to do hygiene? Um, so I. <laughs> Is hygiene canceled? Yeah. Yes. Hy- hygienists are no more. It's just doctor it's only offices. Canceled. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'd like to wait, you know, as ideally mm-hmm. as long as possible and then um, see if uh, the doctor can help me out. She, she wants to work there going forward. So I'm hoping that she'll be willing to keep on working for a little while longer. I mean, COVID is actually a great in your scenario. Like it now is other buyers can't swoop in and do it now. It's going to be delayed yeah. even if someone was ready. Um, and in that time, I would, I would put an LOI with a contingency on getting back to, to production and then build relationship with the seller as soon as you can, you know, talk on the phone, you know, your plans, you're going to keep her employed. Um, that's the route I would go. Question about that. Uh, the broker has asked that I don't contact her. Like, is that something I just ignore or how do I, how do I do that? Definitely don't ignore it. Uh, <laughs> the brokers like to do this and it really bugs me. They keep an iron gate around sellers unless it's like a, when their eyes a serious buyer. So if you if you show the broker whatever he needs to see, does he need to see like your bank relationship that, that they will lend to you once this COVID has gone back? That's probably what it's hinging on. Like, are you lendable? And does the broker know that? Once, that, and like, once you tell the broker you want to do an LOI, if you get an LOI, he's definitely going to let you speak to her. So right. just like you got to be seen as a serious buyer in whatever way that looks like to this broker. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think in the interest of, you know, not letting any doors close, like you said earlier, you know, you definitely want to go ahead and be intentional about this process, even though, you know, the timeline is indefinitely delayed. I mean, you don't want anyone else finding this little diamond in the rough that, that, that you've located. So, um, yeah, I, I'm very excited for you. And, I, and I, I do agree that you should be moving forward with this effective immediately. This is a big diamond, like one of those blood diamond ones on the movie. <laughs> yeah. 
this is this is the uh, reactor that's like in Tony Stark's heart. This is this is what <laughs> this is it. This is paving the way for it. Superhero movies are lost on me, so I don't know what that meant. Uh, not a fan, huh? <laughs> no, unfortunately yeah. not. He just likes to be different. He's seen them all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, go ahead. Then. Um, I had one other question, and as I say it, I'm not seeing it. Um. Oh, you know what? Uh, one thing that we said we would approach is the issue of the benefits. You know, we were going to talk That's about how we can kind of navigate around that. Yeah. So, yeah. So what what are your what say you buy the practice hypothetical? What would your plans be with the benefits? I don't know. Um, it's tough. That's a, a huge benefit. And, you know, half of this practice is production is based on the staff. So I. I, I would assume that a couple of the older staff members will be, you know, retiring soon. So I might mm-hmm. be able to just bring on new staff and have it be yeah. more reasonable. Um, yeah. I did, I did look up on indeed.com for what that website's worth, uh, like average hygienists and assistant salaries in Washington. And, uh, the hygienists are actually all right on par with average $50. An that. hour. Yeah. That's yeah. what we felt too. And yeah. then uh, the assistants, so I mean, one of the assistants is salaried, fifty-five k a year, which depending on how many weeks they work, you know, runs runs into about thirty-three an hour, which is way over uh, Washington's yeah. average. I think is twenty-one per hour for assistants. Um, all, all of them are above that, basically. So, I mean, if they're great, great staff. So you're opinion. generally planning on keeping it unless staff members leave and new ones come. I, I guess so. Yeah. Okay. I wouldn't. Okay. I would cut it. I'll I would cut it. You. <laughs> you don't have to do this. I mean, I, I'm just giving my opinion. Like I, I would, uh, I would not keep it. I would say, you know, I would explain this to him that, Hey, you know, I'm new owner. I'm, I'm not going to unfortunately be able to provide to you this very generous benefit of this old doctor. And, and, and going into that, knowing you might lose some staff for sure. And yeah. I'd be okay with that in a bigger office. We'd be able to take it. But it's, you know, it's quite the benefit. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Because so. like 50% of healthcare would be very generous. 100% plus dependents, plus life insurance, plus free dental work after six months, after six weeks of working, I think. No, can't I, get, I can't get behind I, it. I will play uh, devil's advocate only for a moment. And uh, I, I do, you know, I, I envision, you know, Matt, someone like Matt coming in, busting the doors down saying, Hey, um, I'm taking your, your entire family's health insurance <laughs> that you have enjoyed for all this time. It may very well be tied into the culture of this practice and taking care of families and such. And, and I can imagine there would be some adverse reactions to that. Um, you know, I mean, Matt comes in, he's a handsome guy, uh, despite not being <laughs> much for superhero movies. He kind of does look like one. I mean, I think Iron Man would admit he, he, he looks like he'd be in the Avengers perhaps. But uh-huh. I mean, how, how would you let's let's kind of walk through how you would approach that if if Iron Man would, were kind of a minimal to saying, OK, well, maybe I do want to cut back. How does he approach that that issue? Hey, um, yeah, it's a team meeting. It's not on day one. It's not before you buy the office. It's after a couple of weeks into the practice. I would sit him down and explain it like, look, I'm yeah. you know, I, I'm a I'm a new owner. I mean, you know, unfortunately, a different situation than the seller. I don't have my. Oh, well, you can't say student loans, but that's how I would play in my own shoes. You don't have any. Um, yeah. I would say, you know, I, I have I have a huge debt to pay on this practice. Uh, I don't have a lot of cash flow coming in right now. Um, it is not industry standard in the slightest to give full health insurance. Yeah. I mean, you could also look to cut it in half if you want it to be generous, you know. Um, yeah. But like I said, like in a solo office, I might not do this. In a big office like this, I might think to. Just because I think they can afford to have some people leave without the morale and the patients, okay. you know, be very affected. Yeah. How do you feel about that, Iron Man? Makes me nervous. Yeah. I mean, th- this is kind it's, of like, a, it, yeah, it's, it's an, all hypothetical it's, at this point. Yeah. Sure. I mean, it's an age old question, though. Like, I mean, some people will come into a transition and aren't so afraid to rock the boat. Right. Like they, they go ahead and start making some changes and, and that can cause some turbulence. And I mean, you know, after all, whenever you buy a practice, a majority of what you're paying for is intangible. Right. It's goodwill. It's it's the culture of the practice. It, it's what existed before you were there. 
and you have to question to yourself what's the cost benefit of you know cutting this like am i losing something greater than what i'm gaining and that's going to be something that i think you have to feel out feel out and you know in deciding which way you want to go i i think it is an ongoing process like matt said if it's not something you would swoop in and do on day one you know that that would be that would send people running for the hills i think i think you're going to have to establish some trust and, and establish a clear line of communication um you know where you're able to sit down with folks and like have that sort of straight talk with them and you know you can see what happens and you know maybe a few eggs break but ultimately you know i i, I have confidence that you would make the decision that's right for you understanding all the moving parts and this there. is a great situation for coaching to have to Absolutely. have say george and george in your corner while you're going through this and navigating that that's that's That'd coaching like, one-on-one mm-hmm. i you yeah, know i, I went through similar type of stuff in my first year and having that was you know i talked about it a lot but it was essential yeah yeah what kind of wrench will having the owners stay in the practice throw into that equation do you think that's a good question so the owner the owner's a little younger wants to keep working for a while you said no the, right. the owner the owner is uh, a senior dentist she started the practice in 1984 right. so uh she's older but still as of what we said like she still wants to keep on practicing yeah just not as the owner yeah, yeah. i don't mean i personally don't love it but it could definitely work out great um the, the, it's yeah it's really it's the staff dynamic you know whether they really take you as a new owner and just see her as a provider part of the practice um that's just gonna be something you have to build over time build their trust it's not gonna happen right away or even in the first couple months it's probably gonna take a bit um, to work and that's natural and that's not a reflection of your leadership it's just kind of this you know you're the new guy it's going to take a little time um so it's definitely something to maneuver around it's you know a little wrench but i don't i don't think it's a bad thing i don't think it's like a big roadblock i think it's just something to work around yeah so are there any other concerns that come to mind for you there on that um I guess this could be a good question for just the podcast and other listeners, but you know, when you have a, sure. a multi-doc practice, how should yeah. you look at that staff overhead percentage? And, you know, are there different normal ranges for when you have an associate that's lumped into that, that overhead number for uh, payroll? Right. So historically, and, and Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but whenever we're looking at staff wages, we assume really all doctor production to be kept separate from staff wages. We, we sort of approach it as if you were able to come in and supplement all that production yourself. And if you can't, then obviously there's a conversation about keeping an associate or replacing someone or something like that. But for the, for the sake of evaluating the practice, we generally look at those separate uh, because when you throw doctor production in the staff, you're kind of throwing numbers out of whack and it's hard to really compare things. It's, it's, it's apples and oranges at that point. Would you agree with that, Matt? Yeah, I would keep associate costs out of it. Um, I'm not sure what you did in the spreadsheet, if you did that or not, um, but it I should be pretty not. easy. Yeah. I just, okay. I just, you know, there's one payroll payroll line, so I just put it in the in the spreadsheet. But okay. elsewhere, it does show what the salary or the production is for the other dentist. So I could just pull that pull that number out. Yeah, for you, I would want to see like so. I would I would make that shift to find out what just the staff percentage is and find out what how what what number is wages and what number is benefits. And how exactly big that benefit number is, um, yeah, which will be another deciding factor on what you end up doing with it, how big that number is, and whether you can live with giving that away or not. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. Employee benefits one hundred and ninety eight thousand dollars last year for the insurances and stuff like that. So. That's one hundred ninety eight thousand <laughs> out of your pocket <laughs> into there. Just so you know, that's how it works. Like it's yeah. after tax out of your yeah. pocket to their benefits. Yeah. I mean, ultimately that is a very uncomfortable decision that you have to make. Uh, but that should be weighing into your decision. I mean, that is something that's, that's could literally be picked up right away when you, I mean, obviously not right away, but it's, it's, it's a low hanging fruit, right? And you can choose whether or not you wish to bite from it, but it is there. Um, and you're not necessarily obligated to, uh, continue to offer that just because it was historically. Right. And listen, like most of the problems, quote unquote, uh, with this practice can be fixed with raising production. Like, Absolutely. and there are many avenues to do that. So, yeah. And, and let's, mm-hmm. let's remember, this is a practice that conservatively has 40% hygiene. I mean, it's massive. 
right? Yeah. So, I mean, it's not ringing the towel out by any means diagnostically. It's referring out a lot. Um, Iron Man is is a gunner. He's a boss. He's going to come in there. He's going to learn implants. Mm-hmm. He already has endo. Um, he already has thermal extractions. Like things could really explode in this practice. I like. I I mean, there's there's ops that aren't even being used, yeah. right? So, I mean, at the end of the day, if you if you didn't want to break some eggs, you know, with the with the benefits, I mean, you could outpace that and and maintain the still the, the the culture of, of of providing that if if that is something that you believe is is intrinsically valuable to what you're buying here and you do want to keep it you're not comfortable that's fine i mean that's just that's just sort of something that you're going to be pushing against as you grow um but uh you know that that's just something you're gonna have to evaluate on an ongoing basis and and to tie it back into coaching i think that's that absolutely goes along with you know the acquisition process doesn't end you know as soon as you sign papers, like you're, you're still trying to get it to the point where it's something you're happy with and it, and it matches up with the vision that, you know, you're still forming. But, you know, I, I don't think this practice is where it can be. And I think when someone that is discriminating as you are with the sort of business skills that you have comes in there and, and maximizes it, I mean, it, it, it can be a totally different practice and I think it could be very lucrative for you. At least that's awesome. So, yeah. So, so um, what is, what is like your, where do you like, where, I know I asked you this kind of earlier, but like, where do you see yourself in this practice as far as like day to day? Like, are you, are you working for like, what is the most, what I'm asking is what is the most important thing to you? Is it take home money? Is it days that you work? Is it enjoyment? Like what, what is this all for? Like why go after this big practice? Yeah. Um, I, would uh I, I see myself doing uh you know three about three days of of in the chair working doing dentistry i do enjoy dentistry i don't I don't uh don't nice. plan on you know stopping that um but i would like um time to you know be home with my family i got three little boys that i want to be there you know be present That's while great. they're growing up nice um be able to you know you know, kayak the Puget Sound all the time. I have a kayak, so that's what I'm doing here in Hawaii whenever I can. Um, but yeah, I do see myself being a you know being in the in the operatories, being a producer. Um, I, I do. I recall you saying something along the lines of you wanted to do the Justin Short thing. What did that yeah. mean? Well, just you know, three days a week. Um, okay. I hopefully will be able to you know take some of the uh, earnings out of my future practice and, and put them into other passive investments and, and grow okay. those regular stuff, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Well, fair enough. I mean, I, I think that what you're looking at uh, could certainly service those desires if that ends up being the way you go. So, I mean, I'm a bit envious of you, to be honest. I'm, I'm currently in the practice searching process and um, doing most things off market, kind of hearing some things back. And um, you, now you kind of got me sitting and waiting on that 11 out practice to kind of present itself. So you may be waiting a while, bud. <laughs> <laughs> you will. Don't hold my breath, huh? No. Yeah. yeah. These no, don't I, come around often. Yeah. No. I, and, and that's why I'm, I'm pretty stoked for you there. I man. I think, uh, I think you got a really nice opportunity here and uh, I want to hear, you know, as this process rolls along, I, I'm very curious to see, you know, how the, uh, COVID situation really affects the, the the transition, and I hope that it works in your favor, and I think it will. Uh, but I want to hear back from you and kind of get an update later on. Will do. Yeah, thanks. So what what are, what are the next steps? Where are you going to go from here? Um. Well, work on getting an LOI, I guess. Make sure that uh, my wife's totally on board with uh, the area. That's She's not against it, but uh, <laughs> her license is in Oregon currently. Um, okay. So you have to transfer her license, which is not a huge deal, but you know. Okay. Just another test for her. No big deal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all. That's all just red tape, right? Like. <laughs> yeah. Well, absolutely. I, I definitely uh, recommend that the wife is okay with everything. I think that's what it all comes down to. Yeah. Well, uh, Iron Man, I think this has been an excellent interview. Uh, I think this is probably one of the most fruitful opportunities that we've looked at, uh, at least with this segment of the show. Um, I, I, I think that you have all the tools to, you know, take this ownership as far as you want to go. Um, and so I'm really excited for you and I appreciate you being on. Thank you for having me. It was awesome. Absolutely. It was a lot of fun. Thanks.